So welcome to this, to this water talk. My name is Roy Brouwer. I'm the executive director of the Water Institute, and we're very happy to have you here today with us uh, for the last uh, water talk of the term. We're very honored to have uh, Professor Amy Kraft with us. Before I introduce her, I would just want to acknowledge that I'm participating today from land. That is uh, part of the traditional peoples, um, uh, uh, the neutral Anishinaabeg and Haudenosaunee peoples. Um, we're located on this land that was granted to the Six Nations. It consists of six miles, as you can see here on the slide on each side of the, um, of the Grand River, the watershed in which we're located, where we live and, and, uh, and, and work. Um, and as a newcomer to, to Canada, um, the Water Institute um, and, and uh, as part of the University of Waterloo, we're very committed to raise awareness um, and we're committed to contribute to Canada's truth and reconciliation um, uh, calls for, for action. So please take a minute to um, acknowledge where you are today. Um, and then I'll introduce Professor Amy Kraft. She's a, an award-winning teacher and researcher, recognized internationally as a leader in the area of indigenous laws, treaties, and water. She's an associate professor in the Faculty of Law and holds a university research chair at the University of um, Ottawa in um, Nibi Minawa Aki Inakonikvin, which is indigenous governance in relationship with land and water um, at the University of Ottawa, as I said. Uh, she's an indigenous lawyer uh, from Treaty 1 territory in, in Manitoba, an original um, Anishinaabe Métis law lawyer. And she's the former director of research at the National Inquiry into Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls and the founding director of research at the National Center for Truth and Reconciliation. She practiced at the Public Interest Law Center for over a decade, and in 2016, she was voted one of the top 25 most influential lawyers in Canada. In 2021, Professor Kraft was awarded the prestigious Canadian Bar Association President's Award, and she received the Early uh, Career Researcher of the Year Award at the University of Ottawa. Um, she prioritizes uh, indigenous-led and interdisciplinary research, including through visual arts and film, co-leads a series of major research grants on decolonizing water governance, like a partnership grant, a CERC partnership grant on this topic, and works with many indigenous nations and communities on indigenous relationships with and responsibilities to water, Nibi. Breathing Life into the Stone Fort Treaty is her award-winning book and focuses on understanding and interpreting treaties from an Anishinaabeg Inakonikovin uh, legal perspective. Treaty Words is another book um, and is her critically acclaimed children's book explaining treaty philosophy and relationships. We're very honored to have you here with us, Amy. Um, please come to the floor and uh, let's welcome her with a round of applause. Thank you all. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, greeting you as my relatives, also acknowledging that I'm a visitor from Treaty 1 territory, and uh, very happy you've done the territorial acknowledgement. Um, and uh, again, so happy to be here amongst you today. I'm gonna bring this down a bit. How's the sound? Everyone can hear me? Okay, good. So. Um, today we're going to talk about legal personhood, and I hope none of you are expecting to have a full and complete answer to whether or not personhood is a good thing, if it works, because we're still very much in an exploratory environment in terms of understanding what legal personhood is as it relates to water, uh, what it might mean, and what are some of the implementation mechanisms and uh, positive potential outcomes, and some of the uh, potential dangers of according or granting legal personhood uh, in law. Uh, so this talk is based on a paper that's currently in development. Uh, I've worked with a few of my students, uh, including more recently Alice Libehan, who has done a fair bit of work on this, uh, on this paper. So I want to thank her, as well as uh, the elders that I work with in Treaty 3, uh, area, Treaty 1 area, and many others. As was mentioned in the kind introduction, I hold a university research chair in Nibi Minawaki Nakanagewin, which translates into Indigenous governance in relationship with land and water. 
Okay, relationship with, not over or about or on, it's in relationship with. I think that's a very important component of trying to understand the message of this talk today, which is granting legal personhood, understanding it, but also thinking about what indigenous legal mechanisms have to offer as part of that understanding, or um, in contrast with how personhood might be interpreted from a Western legal lens, uh, and thinking about what indigenous legal mechanisms might offer that are more positive in terms of recognizing the spiritedness and agency of nibe or water. So as mentioned, I come at this from the perspective of decolonizing water, a major research grant, um, and recognizing our sacred relationships with water. And that's a large part of understanding indigenous laws and legal orders. So I'll be focusing on that in the first part of the talk and then moving on to legal personhood and some of the indigenous mechanisms that reflect that agency and spiritedness from uh, different indigenous nations, mostly from the United States and Canada. And obviously that's an ongoing case study. I was mentioning this morning that I have three papers in development on this and none of them are published because I never feel like they're ready or complete. I'm sure many of you can relate to that and there's no exception here when we speak of legal personhood of water. Um, these are some of my publications and you'll notice the common theme here is water, flowing water, um, and recognizing those forms of water. This is another way of representing visually uh, the water that I belong to. And listen to those words, belonging to a water body. And that takes up this important legal notion of jurisdiction that's inherent in all of our discussions about legal personhood. This is Lake Winnipeg, seen from 30,000 feet, I don't know, 20, from a plane. I had to compile, I had to put two pictures side by side to capture the south basin of, uh, of this lake, of this watershed. So you see two rivers that are flowing into that lake. That's how I see my responsibility and jurisdiction. That's the lake that I belong to. And my family comes from the mouth of the river where um, the Winnipeg River flows into the lake. Another way of looking at it here is as a watershed, the second largest one in Canada that flows across the jurisdictions of four Canadian provinces, four American states, Canada, the US, um, and this is an important lake. It's the 10th largest freshwater lake in the world, and uh, there are more than 12 rivers that flow into the lake from east, west, and south. It ultimately all goes uh, north towards the Hudson's Bay. What this is as well is the third largest hydroelectric reservoir in the world. So you've noticed I did some work on hydroelectric development. Um, important to consider how we use the lake. What is the lake's relationship to its environment, but how are pressures on the lake also part of how we understand our responsibilities to it. And in this, you know, the question of jurisdiction is captured by you know, four Canadian provinces, four US states. But also the question of jurisdiction needs to be looked at from that perspective of belonging. And uh, I would suggest that there are three dimensions of jurisdiction that we need to be aware of. Some of you might think geopolitical boundaries are enough of a jurisdictional conundrum for us to handle when we talk about water. Uh, I'm going to suggest that we have more to think about than just geopolitical boundaries. But that physical aspect, that where, which water, um, the geography and hydrology tells us a little bit about that element of jurisdiction. The second is thinking about who is responsible um, in decision making. And that can extend beyond kind of what we inherit, uh, what we inherit when we think about those geophysical boundaries. We can inherit, uh, inherit different understandings if we think about uh, hydrologies and, for example, management at a watershed level rather than uh, thinking about those uh, geopolitical entities. So the where, the who, and uh, about what. What kind of decision making uh, are we uh, affecting? What's the subject matter of the jurisdiction? And as we know, water kind of defies all of that. Most of it's out the window in terms of the Western assumptions of jurisdiction when we think about water. It governs itself in large part. It governs its own hydrology, so the where. It governs who is implicated in decision making. Sometimes water wholly decides for itself despite any human effort. And about what? 
how it's going to move, how much of it is going to move, et cetera. So water really has an important place to play in jurisdiction and asserting its own jurisdiction. And indigenous laws and legal orders have picked up on that historically and understood that that relationship of jurisdiction belonging to water, being in relationship with water, is not one of control. So whereas Western jurisdictions think about control, access, possession, management of water, indigenous laws are focused on relationships of maintenance, of protection, um, ensuring that water is able to fulfill its own jurisdictional aspirations and not seeing environment or water as um, a source of conflict, but rather as an ongoing relationship that is interconnected to other relationships in environment. All right, so jurisdiction. I know, how many of you are lawyers? Are there a few? Okay. All right, thank you for disclosing that. <laughs> uh, lawyers like to talk about jurisdiction and laws, and it, it can be complicated, and it's especially complicated in this context. When we think about you know, state management or Western management of water, even at that, we have what I call muddied jurisdiction, um, really complex understandings of those three dimensions of jurisdiction, the who, the what, and the where. We have uh, domestic laws, so state laws, provincially, federally, territorially, international law has a role to play in water management, as well as indigenous laws and legal orders. So in this last decade, indigenous worldviews have had an increasing influence on those Western legal understandings of the relationship between humans and nature. And that's what I wanna talk about uh, today. So those worldviews can provide an added lens for understanding humankind's appropriate place within nature and our relationships and responsibilities to it. Uh, at an international scale, the legal recognition of water as an autonomous actor, either through legal personhood, the rights of nature, or the recognition of water's agency and through other mechanisms, is increasingly serving as a tool to both protect and conserve bodies of water while also supporting the revitalization of indigenous legal mechanisms and indigenous water governance. So the leadership of indigenous peoples has been acknowledged as a vital component of the effective recognition of implementation of rights of nature. Um, the International Rights of Nature Tribunal has recognized that it cannot fully understand the rights of nature without hearing the wisdom of indigenous peoples. I would take that further to say the indigenous laws and legal orders of indigenous people are essential. Um, the uh, recent report by the Intergovernmental, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change recognizes also the importance of those indigenous laws and governance systems in climate change adaptation and sustainable development. So the paper that this talk is based on uh, looks at different case studies of bodies of water whose rights, legal personhood, spiritedness, and agency, and autonomy, recognizing those are all very different things that are interconnected, how they're recognized through Western legal mechanisms as well as indigenous legal mechanisms. They demonstrate how natural entities can be protected and conserved in different ways and how those recognitions can serve to revitalize the relationships and responsibilities that Indigenous people and others have in relationship with water. So one of the core questions, and I'll get to that a little bit later, is which water? And I'm sure that's a burning question in your mind as well. To date, it's been very much focused on particular water bodies and in large part uh, rivers. So rivers that flow and have, quote unquote, a beginning and an end. For those of you who are water flow scientists, you can debate that, but generally kind of a circumscribed physical uh, or hydrological area. And so those case studies uh, are based on those who recognize rights of nature more generally, specific personhood of water bodies, as well as indigenous legal mechanisms that are akin to personhood, but take a step further into spiritedness and agency. One might wonder why that's this is important. Probably not you, because you're sitting here listening to this talk today, so you've obviously acknowledged some importance to it, but 
I think the world has to grapple with this jurisdictional complexity of questions over protection of water bodies and the assertion of private and other interests in relation to water and other resources in an extractivist um, era. This, these are images of, actually this is my quiz for today. Where are these images from? Anyone know? Sorry? Standing Rock, yeah, you bet. Um, so what we see here is the camp, some of the other images from Standing Rock, and at the center you see uh, what I call an image of conflicts of laws. This doesn't look like your international law text, but it is a depiction of how state law relating to um, civil disobedience, trespass law is being enacted at Standing Rock versus the laws that are being upheld by the indigenous water protectors in the context of pipe, pipeline development in this territory, specifically a pipeline carrying oil that was to um, be dug under the, the river and could impact significantly the river's health, but also the drinking water source for the Standing Rock Nation. So these conflicts are not isolated to Standing Rock. It stands as an example, but these conflicts between these legal systems and the values that underpin it will necessarily arise in multiple contexts around the world in relation to water quality, but also in relation to um, issues that arise from climate change, which I think the world is turning more attention to now. And hopefully many of you are working in this area and have some wonderful, brilliant solutions that we can chat about during lunch. Um, I want to kind of ground this and contextualize it, though, in, in this imperative that we have received from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada that spoke to reconciliation as an ongoing process of establishing and maintaining respectful relationships. So this is where I find the grounding for a lot of my uh, work and on Indigenous laws and legal orders. What the TRC also said is this is going to require some real societal change. So we need to move away from this conflict into trying to figure out what reconciliation might look like and adapting the real societal change that's required to move forward. As part of the TRC's work, it also indicated to us that the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples was the cornerstone for reconciliation. And so I want to point specifically to UNDRIP Article 25 that has two very distinct components that are uh, important for us to understand. The first is that the UNDRIP recognizes the distinctive spiritual relationship that Indigenous peoples have with lands and territories and waters. So when we think specifically to water, a distinctive spiritual relationship that is considered to be a right uh, of Indigenous peoples to maintain it and that that right includes a right to uphold uh, those responsibilities that flow from that spiritual relationship uh, to maintain that for future generations. Okay, so two dimensions there that are quite significant that aren't recognized in um, the laws of Canada to date, right? Does any, has anyone ever seen the recognition of a spiritual relationship to water in the laws of Canada? The Canada Water Act you know, from the 1970s does not do that, I'll, I'll let me tell you. <laughs> um, and it doesn't talk about future generations. It doesn't even talk really about sustainability. It's uh, antiquated and, and speaks really of a provisionment of water for the purposes of agriculture. So we have some catching up to do in Canadian law to kind of meet what is set now as an international standard in the arena of Indigenous rights. Um, how do we begin to do that? This is, um, this is an institution. Uh, it does not look like your university. It's an institution of Indigenous lawmaking that takes place on the land. This is the annual Nibé gathering. Uh, it is an Indigenous law lodge where uh, different Indigenous nations are coming together from across Canada and now across the world uh, and has taken place for over uh, a decade now and where law commitments to um, enacting the legal responsibilities that we have to water are shared and mutually agreed to and enforced. So this becomes a place uh, on the White Shell River where uh, there's an exchange of legal knowledge uh, and uh, agreements to work together. 
It is based on different sets of laws that have different sources. So indigenous laws being based on spiritual instructions as well as laws of nature. So laws of nature being that which we see uh, modeled in our natural environment and that we can then replicate as humans. So how things, uh, beings that are part of nature have developed ways of functioning in relation to each other. And based on those two sources of law, a level of customary law that's developed over time. So where we as humans say, hey, let's look at these spiritual instructions and laws of nature and maybe model our behaviors on the things we're able to observe from our natural environment and that which we have inherited as instructions. Uh, if this seems complicated, the treaty words book, the children's book, actually talks a lot about this in a story form. So uh, it would be fun to sit and read that together today. But it does speak to exactly this interaction between these legal systems. As a last layer of this, and attempting to apply those other sources of law is a human and deliberative process. So that means when we're faced with a particular problem or a question, we engage a human process to try and understand that customary law and laws of nature to help us resolve a particular quote unquote legal problem or an issue that arises. Back to Western legal systems, they often start with this human deliberative process, right? We have a problem, we need to make law. Uh, some of science is actually based around that. We have a problem, we need to make some rules to address that particular issue. Um, without necessarily taking into account those other sources of law. So this is represented here as concentric circles so that we understand that when we're going to make those human uh, deliberative decisions that we need to take all of those other pieces into account, things that have lasted uh, or that have been part of decision making, indigenous decision making over lands and waters in relationship with lands and waters, I'm going to correct myself, um, for millennia, right? And so our human responses are an added layer to that. I'm not following my own notes. Um, and so we have these laws that are helping us to make decisions and processes that are attached to that. Um, and I have a short video that I wanted to share with you that explains some of that, um, that thought. I can offer an understanding of Anishinaabe law as I've come to know it, and I'm still learning because I think every person, and we know this, every person is continuously learning about what it is to live in the world. And uh, I have elders that say Anishinaabe law is not a philosophy or a theory, it's a way of life. And so we practice that way of life and we learn from it. And to think to Anishinaabe law as something that we're born with, as, as a set of sacred or spiritual instructions that are given to us as we come, as we journey towards the earth, allows us then to see the world differently and learn from our natural environment. And so that creates from this, this core of spiritual law an outer layer of natural law. And that natural law is what we observe from looking at our other brothers and sisters that are part of creation. From there, we've developed this whole wealth of law over time. And it's a law that governs interactions amongst humans um, and as well as other beings. And how do we manage all of those messy relationships? Building on all of that and, and sometimes in response to a particular situation, we'll have um, what it is referred to as human law. And that's uh, sometimes also talked about it in the context of temporal law. So it's a law that comes in um, a particular form at a moment in time, given a particular context, and that is supported by that core of spiritual law, that understanding that comes from the natural world, the law that we've developed over time. And then we have a human response to a particular context and an ability to make decisions based on our protocols and our understanding of all of these levels of law that are ebbing and flowing and interacting with each other so that we can have appropriate human responses and that we can communicate with each other about what those responsibilities and obligations are. That's the basic structure of Anishinaabe law. And when we think about water, 
um, as part of that, we have spiritual instructions relating to water. We see water's interaction in the natural environment and how other beings interact with water. And that means observing natural environment, seeing what's happening with the water itself, but other beings in creation, fish, frogs, snakes, trees that surround the water, rocks that hold the water line. We see the fluctuations in the high water mark by looking at those rocks. So all of those other beings are being responsive to the water. And for some reason as humans, we sometimes think, well, water is this resource. It's either gonna give us power through hydroelectric generation, or it's going to sustain us by being clean for us to drink. And we think of it as really fragmented resources. Article 25 of UNDRIP ensures that there's a protection of this longer term relationship the spiritual relationship between Indigenous people and their waters, lands, territories um, in a way that allows for protection of future of, of that water or that land or that territory for future generations. So there are elements of um, that are found within UNDRIP which is aiming to affirm the self-determination of Indigenous people around the world in recognizing that special relationship that people have with lands and territories and that includes that relationship with water and to ensure that it can be preser preserved over time and recognizing also the spiritual nature of it. So UNDRIP is not recognizing water as a resource to be owned or managed or controlled like most Western legal systems do, but is actually saying as Indigenous people, there's something further to that relationship. There's something that is deeper that um, that emanates from your relationship with water and that you have a right to preserve and maintain that. So the ways in which we preserve and maintain is in accordance with these Indigenous laws and legal orders that are founded, as you've seen from the video, on relationships and the sense of collective well-being, or what we call minobimatsu in, in Anishinaabemun. Contrast that with Western legal values or underpinnings to the legal system, which are very much in the individual and in the protection of private property. So I want you to think about those uh, underlying philosophical differences between legal systems as uh, an indication of how we manifest our protection of rights of, the, of nature, rights of the environment, um, and indigenous mechanisms. This is an image of those multilateral relationships that are spoken to in the video. And what's interesting is that in most legal systems, we have uh, two parties that are in conflict or opposition to each other. One party has an obligation towards the other, and the other has a right in relation to that obligation. And often, our legal interactions are about breaches of those obligations. And this system is based on a whole wealth of multilateral relationships that aren't necessarily grounded in conflict, that are about the maintenance of that good, good order, that minobimatsuin, or well-being. And the way that was articulated in relation to Anishinaabe, Nibi, and Akonagewan, or water principles, is in these seven core principles. So understanding that water has a spirit, that we don't own water, that it's life, um, that it can heal, and that women have a special jurisdiction or responsibility to water. And I won't take that up today, but I think it's a very fascinating subject that we should be chatting about a little bit more. Um, also in those sets of responsibilities is that respect for the water, the recognition that it has a duality and that it can suffer. And its relationship with land is intimate and connected, and that's part of that legal understanding as well. So when uh, Western legal systems want to separate into silos different kinds of resources or different extractive activities, the holism uh, of indigenous legal orders is uh, explicitly recognized. So when we then turn to thinking about personhood of water, we do need to acknowledge that even though um, that's a Western legal mechanism. It has a, a history in kind of two sources. One is recognition of personhood, of corporations, churches, that idea that in law you can be a legal entity. Um, and also a movement in terms of rights of nature that dates back to the 1970s and kind of has this manifestation 
at an international level, and especially in South America, reflected through concepts of ben, buen vivir, um, so that idea of good living that reflects some of the uh, indigenous legal values that I've started to talk about. So there's this interconnection between ideas of rights of nature, more holy, uh, and the idea of legal personhood. Part of my critique of that, though, is that in large part, those are centered around protection, preservation, and conservation of either uh, a natural environment or water for the purposes of human interests, right? So it's still centering very much the human in that activity of protection of water or environment, rather than looking to uh, a recognition of response, sets of responsibilities. Although uh, there are some underpinnings of uh, both the rights of nature movement and personhood of water that do reflect uh, that intent to work for and protect the water uh, in itself for its own integrity. And you'll see that very much reflected in the indigenous legal examples. Um, so although the rights of nature movement um, has been influenced by indigenous worldviews, as I mentioned, including in South America, uh, and they share philosophical objectives regarding the protection of nature, um, it, again, it centers that, that human uh, anthropocentric underpinning, and it's ultimately a tool to protect the natural environment for the use and enjoyment of humans. We have moved kind of beyond the whole of rights of nature approach to legal personhood of water more recently, and this is a 21st century movement that many of you will be familiar with, probably at a very high level, because it's relatively new. The Wanganui River is probably the most famous example of it, a 2017 recognition through legislation of uh, the personhood of water, of a particular river. Again, that question of jurisdiction becomes important. It's not water as a, as a whole, but rather uh, the river's right uh, to, to flow. Um, in most cases in legal personhood, um, and, and maybe it's fair to say legal personhood is a dynamic concept that's rooted in that Western tradition um, that recognizes an entity as possessing rights and the corresponding legal obligations that are attached to it. Um, Non-human entities who are recognized as legal persons may have rights similar to those enjoyed by humans, such as holding property, entering into a binding contract, having legal standing, um, to bring or defend claims and having rights and responsibilities that differ from those of natural persons. In that case, the rights of a river to flow. Um, one or more humans can represent those non-human entities through uh, legal mechanisms like guardianship, uh, agency or trustee relationships, and uh, they are aimed to ensure that the legal person's interests are protected. So there's this third party legal mechanism of someone who is responsible for fulfilling, um, or not fulfilling, for uh, advancing the rights of the legal person, okay? But the question remains, is water a person? Uh, what does being a person in law actually mean in the context of something that is not a corporation or a church or an entity, an organization of people? Um, what does it mean in law, but what are the mechanisms by which we recognize personhood? Which water? That question I asked earlier. You know, how do we bound or define which water is protected? What is water? It comes from the sky, rain, snow. It's sitting in our environment. It comes up from the ground. So which, which water are we talking about? If we accept the notion of jurisdiction that asks us to entertain that question of which, which form of water. Um, and is personhood actually an appropriate mechanism to recognize the spiritedness and agency from uh, an indigenous jurisdictional perspective? So we have different legal mechanisms for this recognition of personhood, and what I suggest in the paper is that each of them has its own set of implications. So in legislation, uh, which we see with the Wanganui River, there are detailed kind of components of the legal personhood recognition. A structure that's set up with uh, guardians and trustees of the water itself. And 
uh, in the legislation, things are clearly addressed and identified, although there are some gaps of, of understanding. And if you speak to the trustees of the Wanganui River, they'll say, how we actually roll this out is not provided for or clear in the legislation. Is there a way to, is this better? Are you hearing feedback? Um, so in addition to legislation, we have um, legal settlements, and that's also the subject of the Wanganui River. Perfect. Is that better for you? It's a lot better for me. Thank you. Um, so the uh, Wanganui also comes from a settlement. We also have case law, cases from around the world where courts have recognized that water is a legal person deserving of protection, uh, naming different bodies or uh, governments as responsible for giving that effect. There's also constitutions that have a recognition of personhood or something akin to that. Uh, also, citizens have enacted uh, bills of rights, resolutions, and bylaws to recognize legal personhood. And then we have some indigenous legal mechanisms through declarations, ceremonies, practices, um, bylaws, and other forms of resolutions as well. So a lot of different legal actors doing different legal work uh, recognizing this, um, this personhood of water. Here are some of the examples of where uh, there has been recognition of uh, legal personhood and agency, they don't all look the same. And we have one example really in Canada, a recognition of personhood on the Magpie River. Um, but this is, a, as I said, as I mentioned, an international movement. And in large part, it's in response to one of two things, protection of something that is pristine or remediation of reparation in, in that of a river or another water body that's in desperate need of uh, protection and remediation. So either protecting pristine or trying to fix something that's broken. Okay, so those are the contexts in which this will arise. And we see those different examples around the world. Bangladesh's approach in 2019 was to recognize personhood of all the rivers in the country. Awesomely complicated jurisdictional issues because w there isn't a body of water that starts or stops at the border of that nation. Right? So it is engaging this whole level of state recognition, but also uh, international law and diplomacy uh, in addressing some of those uh, major challenges. And there is also that conceptual difference between recognizing the rights of something and recognizing the agency of something. So this is very much this legal personhood movement is acknowledging that something, in this case, water bodies, are in need of protection, but does not recognize that inherent agency of those water bodies. So there are various indigenous legal mechanisms that do try and capture that, that duality, that protection of something in need of protection, but also a recognition to a certain extent of the agency of those water bodies and of water itself. Uh, the paper canvasses uh, multiple U.S. examples here on indigenous legal mechanisms. For example, the Ho-Chunk Nation um, that has a tribal constitution revision in 2016 to recognize the rights of nature. So they go broad, right? The, and they amend their own constitution. Uh, but it is declaratory, so it doesn't have an enforcement mechanism built into it. Whereas the Nez Perce um, tribe looked at the Snake River uh, which was considered the most endangered river in the United States in 2021, and created a resolution in 2020 that recognized the fundamental rights of the Snake River. So they recognized the rights of the river, not personhood, not rights of nature, the rights of the river to exist, flourish, evolve, flow, regenerate, and the right to restoration. So we see some language here that's giving us uh, a bit of guidance in terms of the intention of what the Nez Perce tribe is looking for. And a lot of that language is replicated in other indigenous legal mechanisms that aim to protect either a water body, uh, rights of nature, or another uh, being that is part of that uh, natural environment. The Ponca Nation, again, uses that um, uh, language of uh, inherent rights of nature, and it adopts a resolution with a responsibility to act to protect nature and for future generations. 
they reserve themselves the right to bring uh, violations to their tribal court, but the question of jurisdiction is engaged again. Do they have jurisdiction over non-citizen persons? And do they have jurisdiction outside of their reservation? So those are some limitation on the exercise of that jurisdiction. Um, the Menominee River, river uh, is also protected in a resolution in 2020 that asserts the river's inherent legal rights. So they're actually saying that the river has rights and recapturing some of that language of a right to naturally exist, flourish, regenerate, evolve, uh, restoration, recovery, preservation, and a right to abundant, pure, clean, unpolluted water, uh, including groundwater. So they go into great depth and the right of the river to carry out its natural ecosystem functions. So they're saying the water does have that agency and they're recognizing that in um, their resolution. So those are some examples that touch on these indigenous legal mechanisms and different dimensions to be aware of. There are a few more um, that we canvas in the paper, including the Klamath River. And what's interesting in that example is that it speaks to the significance of the relationship between the Klamath River and the salmon. So really the effort was not directly the preservation of the river, the protection of the river. It was about the salmon, but the conduit of the salmon and the salmon relationship with the Yurok tribe is the river itself. Um, and so the, the dams on that river had been uh, in, in operation for a very long time, hydroelectric and uh, irrigation um, functions, and it was draining more than half of the water out of that river every year. So in 2019, the Tribal Council of the Yurok Tribe passed a resolution recognizing the personhood of that river. There's also a big movement through a restoration corporation to decommission the dams on the Klamath River. Some of you might be uh, familiar with that. And in that resolution, they also appointed a trustee for the Klamath River's legal rights, uh, declared itself as a fiduciary to protect the river um, and that ensure that it would be responsible for its restoration. So they've taken this step of claiming a fiduciary duty, which is no light uh, duty, uh, a fiduciary duty for the river, which is a Western legal mechanism, but is giving effect to the values and principles of the Yurok tribe's own legal system. Another example um, are the rights of Monomen, and I want to use this as just an illustration of how, uh, does anyone know what Monomen is? Rice, wild rice, yes. Um, it's in the United States and California. Okay. Yeah, West Coast. Um, uh, so this is White Earth First Nation, Minnesota. Uh, they passed the Rights of Monoman Ordinance as an extension of their treaty and Aboriginal rights. So they actually pick up on federal law and their treaty and Aboriginal rights to uh, protect the rice. And the rice has a right to a clean environment and to clean water. So by extension, it's really a whole of nature approach but it focuses on the primary relative of uh, the uh, White Earth First Nation, the Anishinaabe people, uh, to the, their relationship to Monomen or the rice. So they put the Monomen at the center of conservation with the intention uh, to more broadly impact the watershed and surrounding territory. And this is our Canadian, our first Canadian example, the Magpie River. Um, and there were major concerns about hydroelectric development on this river, and in 2021, it is uh, declared a legal person by an alliance for the river. And two sister declarations by the nations, um, uh, the Inu of Iquanichit and the uh, regional municipality of uh, Comté de Megani. And they, do, they exercise their jurisdiction separately, but they issue sister resolutions that say the same thing. So they didn't try and combine it into one. They said, we recognize our separate and distinct authority. We're both going to uh, pronounce ourselves on the personhood of this river and uh, work to represent it through legal guardianship. So that's what's in play right now. Okay, so these are some uh, amazing examples. They have actually Inu youth working up on the Magpie River to uh, affirm their uh, jurisdictional uh, authority and occupy their traditional territory. It's such a beautiful example. 
And I think probably one of the stronger examples here is coming from the Tsilkotin Nation in uh, British Columbia, where they adopt the Sturgeon River Law in 2020. And the law recognizes the water, um, that the water is a life form. It has its own spirit with human qualities. It's not a resource, it's a gift. And it emphasizes the relationship and responsibility held by the Tsilkotin to the river and all species it supports. So the law states that the river has a right to decisions about its care and use, so its own inherent jurisdiction, and has to be considered and respected, um, as do all of the other beings in creation. The law applies to people using the river, discharging into the river, or impacting the Tsilkotin title, rights, and interests. So this is a nation that had a recognition, a judicial recognition of their Aboriginal title. So I think this is one of the strongest examples of an assertion of full jurisdiction. Okay, so these are, we've, we've taken a, a crazy journey through an important geography um, and looking at some of these examples. Some of the common themes that arise here are that um, there's a base of recognition of inherent authority, but also the recognition of rights of uh, rivers. So it's very recognition-based. Compliance mechanisms um, and enforceability mechanisms are not always built into these legal exercises. Generally, there's a whole ecosystem acknowledgement of some form in these legal um, recognitions. Uh, there's also an important recognition of past and future harm that are part of each mechanism. And all of them decenter humans. So uh, that's an important dimension as well to think about the human interest being uh, decentered in each of these examples. And often it's establishing a protection in the form of either land guardians or legal guardians or both, a combination of both. So those are the common themes that were established. I would love to chat about how we applied them in the Nibi Declaration, but I know we're running short on time and I want to save time for questions. But this is definitely one um, space in which a lot of these principles have been taken up. So it's not a formal declaration of legal personhood, but rather a declaration from the uh, nation of Treaty 3 in recognizing its inherent responsibility to water. So I wanted to end, I think, in saying, you know, there are different ways of asserting this jurisdiction, either through responsibilizing, taking authority, uh, or assuming authority for protection. And you've seen all of these different legal mechanisms engaged and engaged with these common themes. I think the, the core of it is that what's so interesting is the language of legal personhood actually talks about these water bodies being a person. But what most of these mechanisms are actually doing is decentering the human person and recognizing water bodies in and of themselves. So I thank you for taking the time to engage with us today in all of the work that you're going to do to engage others in parts of this conversation. And I'm looking forward to seeing how a lot of this evolves over time uh, through these different legal and political mechanisms that are associated to these different uh, jurisdictions. So miigwech, and I look forward to our discussion. Th thank you very much, Amy. So we have time for a couple of questions. Anyone wants to kick off? Please introduce yourself very shortly. I'll start here and then we'll go up. Thanks for that. I think everybody in here agrees that water bodies should have legal, you know, rights. I just wondered, with respect to rivers, for example, um, it's complicated because many rivers are impacted already. But I just wondered, how do you define what's sort of a normal flow pattern for a river uh, so that when something happens to that river system, something, somebody's taking water out of the system or damming it up? Um, do, do you, is that an important part of this whole thing is to define what the normal flow pattern of a river is, and given the complication of climate change, that will change it itself. So it, it, not trying to introduce a complication here, but it seems to me that, you know, when this is challenged, um, that there has to be some definition or quantification of, of what 
would be an acceptable normal slope pattern in the river. That's it. Thanks. Yeah, that's an important comment question. Um, that's what the Magpie River example is meant to do because the Ramen River, which is directly connected to it, has hydroelectric development and significant changes. Um, one of the books that I showed early on in one of the first slides is the Kiosk, not in our backyard book. Kiosk is one of many dams on the Nelson River that has been significantly impacted. So, you know, thinking about what do you do in unaffected territories versus those that have significant amounts of development on them, they're going to be different responses. And that's why I, I underlined that this arises in kind of those two different contexts. I was on the Atrato River in Colombia last May, and it's a completely devastated river. I don't think anyone knows what quote unquote normal actually is because that, and I think that ties to science and science responsibility for baselines, which we don't have for a lot of the rivers in terms of flow and what, like water quantity, but also water quality. So establishing some baselines for all of the water bodies, maybe that's a role for the Canada Water Agency um, in you know, thinking about what it can do to, to, uh, to think about what kind of legacy we leave for decision making in the future. A large part of my work is actually around indigenous decision making uh, and how it's not only indigenous forms of knowledge that should filter into Western mechanisms of decision making, but that we need to make decisions using indigenous principles of decision making. And sometimes we don't have the data to support that. So what I've heard from a lot of the nations that I work with is we just need to have a better understanding of or acknowledgement of all the interruptions that exist so that we can have a sense of what is a normal flow, um, or at least an idea of, and then base our future decisions or our reparation or undoing, like for example, the Klamath, our undoing uh, on that information. Thank you. We have another question here. Thank you for your talk. My name is Hugh. I'm fascinated by this topic and I really enjoyed your, your presentation. Um, I'm interested in the who represents the river. And because we all have values and beliefs and the people who are assigned as guardians will have values and beliefs and they may not align with the entire communities that are in that watershed or I'm very interested in groundwater in, a, in an aquifer area. So I'm just wondering what processes might be out there within the future system to negotiate you know, common outcomes so that they, they meet everybody's interests. And that may be impossible, but I'm just curious about your thoughts on that. Okay, I'm going to declare my bias. I'm, I'm about to release a report with David Suzuki Foundation on, uh, on governance and, and shared governance. And ultimately, I believe Indigenous nations should be leading all of our governance efforts. But different examples that arise in the case of legal personhood um, have been um, in the settlements and in the legislation, Wanganui River, for example, a trusteeship that is equal numbers of appointments from the parties, the state, the um, uh, Aotearoa government, the New Zealand, I was trying to think of the English term, New Zealand and, and the, the Wanganui. Um, in other cases, there's a recognition by courts that it's the government's responsibility on the Atratu in Colombia. It's actually in the legal decision that a number of people would be appointed to this guardians network for the river, including Afro-Colombians, indigenous people, representatives of the state. And in some cases, industry has a seat at the table. So that becomes really complex when there's conflicting interests. And what we conclude in this, this uh, report is that the most successful, um, so far, methods of co-governance are actually having indigenous people on land um, and that even representatives of other entities and other governments, that they be indigenous people from that territory, so a responsiveness to land. And that kind of ties into a broader theory about indigenous law coming from the land and only being properly exercised when it's, or, or good decision making only really taking place when it's in connection to the territory. And for example, in the languages of that, of that territory. Yeah. Thank you. We have time for one more question, anyone? So maybe just very quickly from my side, then before we close. Um, so I was just wondering about how um, you integrate these indigenous laws and regulations. It, it, it sounds to me as an outsider very much like you're talking about regenerative processes that have to be respected. Or is there anything else that you could? 
think of when you when you are you're you are even talking about indigenous instructions, perhaps even for how you engage with with the natural environment. Yeah. When, what's interesting, uh, recently I played a board game that, and we, we kind of want to shy away from the language of board game, but about Cree laws with students. And one of the concepts, one of the legal principles is, is go slow. And that's so antithetical to a lot of the way, uh, the ways in which decision making is, is taken up. So what I'd like to see is kind of presumptive decision making that engages with indigenous approaches at the front end and having to reflect that in any additional decision making that's made by the state. Um, and again, that question of jurisdiction becomes so incredibly important. And I think part of the thesis here is that water is gonna do what it wants to do despite some of our best efforts anyway. So engaging water into that conversation. Um, you know, one of the, the questions that I ask youth is like, hydroelectric dams, did anyone ask the fish what they thought? You know, there's processes for petitioning and asking questions of water bodies. And right now, uh, one example of that is taking water from all of, not all of them, but the first that were recognized as having legal personhood and actually putting them into Lake Winnipeg and exchanging the water so that the water can have its conversation. Um, as a social, science, social sciences scientist, I don't know that I'll ever have a concrete answer to that but it's employing an indigenous methodology to you know, let the water do its own work and kind of stand aside and be prepared to be guided or directed in whatever way uh, that might take form. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, let's give Dr. Kraft another round of applause. Thank you so much.